If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask you to turn to Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 10. Uh, while you're turning there, uh, Brother Jody has come to us and asked for an anointing. Uh, his heart is not doing well. His heart rate's down to like in its 30s. And so we will do that, and uh, I don't have any anointing oil here, so if my mother-in-law has any oil, she does, uh, we will do that after services today. Amen. And, uh, Amen. and uh, my nursing side immediately said, well, you're going to have to have a pacemaker. But my pastor side, side said, it may not be necessary. Oh. Uh, and so uh, we'll pray for that. Leviticus chapter 10 in the first verse. The Bible says, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, Is it, is it, the, is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh to me, and before all the people I will be glorified? And Aaron held his peace. And Moses called, uh, and Moses called Mishael uh, and Elazaphan, the sons of Uziah, the uncle of Aaron, and said unto them, Come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they came near and carried them in their coats out of the camp as Moses had said. And Moses said unto Aaron and to Eleazar and to Ithamar, his sons, <clears throat> Excuse me, uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest you die. The people put your brethren, but let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the morning which the Lord hath kindled. And you shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die, for the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink much wine, nor strong drink thou, for thy sons with thee, when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die, it shall be a statute forever throughout all, throughout your generations. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your blessed word. We thank you for each and every one that is here this morning. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that you send our way. God, now we pray that you would open your word to our hearts and our minds, and we'd be faithful to give you the praise for it. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now here we read some fairly familiar verses of Scripture. Uh, the sons of... Uh, of Aaron dying because they worship the Lord wrong. Now, we live in a day and age today where most people say that that would be an impossibility, that you can't worship the Lord wrong, uh, but I beg to differ. Now, I will say this, there's nothing wrong with the way that we have services set up at New Testament. 99% uh, of Baptist churches do the same thing. You come in, you sing three songs, you have Sunday school, you sing another couple of songs, and then you have the preaching time. Uh, and again, nothing wrong with that, but let me say this in regards to worship, that is not, that is not really worship. Now, uh, I believe what we had today with Brother Junior and Sister Donna is worship. That, that's a time when you literally sense the Lord God of heaven being lifted up. Uh, when it's not about you, it's about the Lord, and he is lifted up. So it ought to be the desire of every church to worship the Lord. And there's a right way and a wrong way. Think about the New Age movement and, uh, and, and you know what, they, they, they have 80s music with Christian words and they run around and, and act crazy. 
is that worship? And I, I would have to beg to differ. What does the Bible say concerning one thing in the church? Let everything be done decently and in order. And, and, and stuff like that is just not orderly. So we find a very pointed example when it comes to worship, God means business. You don't, you know the only way that we can approach him to start with is on the blood and the merit of Christ? That, that, that is a serious thing, is that we come before him in worship on the merit of another. We don't just come to do it uh, to fulfill, our, fulfill ourselves, but to lift God up. Now, there were four sons of Aaron, and two of them decided to try something new. And uh, it did not work out. You know, everybody wants, well, let's try this. Let's try something new. Well, be cautious in trying something new. Be cautious in doing something different. Uh, the first verse, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censor. Now, I want you to see what they had. The equipment was appropriate. That censer was what they were to use when they, they went into the men holies, not the holy of holies, but the men holies, they were to take that sin, uh, censer and offer up an incense offering. The censer was present, but the problem was what's in it. You know, I, I, I feel today a lot of people come to church, they bring their censer, but what's in it is the problem. Uh, coming before the Lord with, with, with things when they, when uh, coming before, before the Lord with what they call worship, and there's no sincerity. There, there's no realness. There, there, there's no, no uh, thrust within them to honor and worship God. That was these individuals. Now, the rest of that uh, verse says, and put incense uh, and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. Now, you know, uh, it seems very simplistic. Just obey God. Just put in that censer what he wants in that censer, right? But you know, nothing is that simplistic to man. We always want something new. Something stimulating, something that feels good. Uh, and you know what? And the majority of them, what it is, is to draw a crowd. That's their only interest whatsoever, is to see the numbers go up. But we find that that is not worship. And so uh, they got this bright idea that we'll... And you know what? I don't know that much about incense. Uh, I, I kind of have allergies, so I don't, I don't really. But, you know, in the 80s, that was a big thing. You got those little sticks, and you set them on fire, and had all this incense and color and smelly candles and all that crazy stuff. Uh, it was very simple to put what was supposed to be in there, was it not? And they got this broad idea. And, you know, have you ever thought maybe the incense that they put in smelled better? Uh, just because they did something different didn't mean that, that it wasn't appealing. The flesh, the flesh likes appealing things. They, they, they may, whatever they do in there, it may smell really good. But it was against God. And our worship, whether it, it may not feel as good as what other people is doing, but we are to follow the, uh, the template that God has given us. Verse 2, And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they, devoured, and they died before the Lord immediately. Immediately the judgment of God. Isn't it a great blessed Sunday morning that we have the person of Christ to buffer us? You know why that don't happen today? If we do things wrong, if we mess things up, if we say things in the wrong way, it's because we have the merit of Christ standing in us, or we would have uh, we would end up just like these two individuals did. That's right. That's right. And, and thanks be to God that we, that we have that buffer of the person of Christ. But uh, these boys did. 
And they found out what the full judgment of God is. So that puts in my heart this. Worshiping God is a very serious thing. If you can die over it, that's pretty serious, isn't it? And, and, and so when we, when we come to the Lord in worship, uh, we need to keep that in the forefront of our minds that, that it, it is done, on, done His way. Verse 3. And Moses said unto Aaron, That is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh unto me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Now I want you to see that, uh, that what, Moses, what Moses said to Aaron, you got to come before him sanctified. You've got to come before in the right heart. Uh, sanctified means set apart. You have to be prepared. You have to be ready. These boys were not prepared, and what they had prepared was the wrong thing. And so he said, he said you know, and I can't imagine losing a child. Can you? I, I can't ma imagine outliving my children. But not only did was he cons those boys consumed by the wrath of God, Moses says, Aaron, don't you cry about it. Yeah, absolutely. Don't you be upset about it. God was righteous. God did the right thing. And he took them because they sinned. That's, a, uh, that's almost an impossible thought to me. But I do know that that was the expectation of the Almighty. And again, that makes me think again, when you think about the love you have for your children and your grandchildren, and, and, and the Almighty says you can't even shed a tear over this. That, that's serious stuff. So we, we certainly then need to think about, are we worshiping? You know, uh, I think the sign out there still has it. It says worship, it has Sunday school and, and worship. And it has 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock. But do we do that? A lot of times we come and listen to preaching, right? Part of the Lord's Day. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a good thing. You know how people are saved, according to the Bible? By hearing the gospel. And so that's a good thing, but is it worship? No. And I'm not sure that it is. No. You see what I'm saying? And, and so we see that... However we approach worship, which is simply lifting God up, it has to be on His terms and not on our ideas. Uh, then the rest of that verse says, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh unto me. In other words, lifted up by the priests, lifted up by the elders, and before all the people, I will be glorified. Now, so we find the very essence of worship is to glorify God. To, and that simply means to illuminate or to shed light upon. So whatever we do is work for worship is not about us. You know, uh, ladies, all y'all that can play the piano, I trust you're playing it to glorify God. Uh, preachers, I, tr I trust your preaching to glorify God. Now, uh, at least if nothing else, I'm honest. Uh, uh, this is, uh, I, I think I've preached in the flesh. I'd be very safe to say that. Shame on me, but at least I'm honest, right? And you know what I found when preaching in the flesh? Nothing, nothing whatsoever is accomplished. That's when uh, I think we've got 10 more minutes. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and so we see then that however we approach this, uh, it needs to be biblical, and it needs to be that we're really lifting God up. And we won't read it for time's sake, but the, the rest of it, it tells how the bodies were carried out, and it was emphasized. Now, 
Uh, unlike us, the church age and, and the Old Testament age and this are very the very opposite. Uh, in the church age, men are not to come covered. That's why, and, and years ago, I didn't even know what, why they did this, but even at the ball field, when they had prayer, you could still have prayer for the kids playing ball back then, the men would take their hats off. And the, the reality was this, they didn't know why they were doing it either. It was tradition. It had become tradition. And even today, uh, we come into the Lord's house, men never wear hats, women come covered. But in the Jewish culture, it was exactly the opposite. The men came covered. And they had what was called a prayer shawl. Uh, remember Lydia, the, the seller of purple in the New Testament, Acts chapter 16? Uh, that was, that, many think that was her occupation, was to make these prayer shawls. Now, in a time of grief, the men threw those things off and they ripped their garments and they grieved. And he said, Aaron, don't you do it. Don't you do it. They got what they deserved. Now that is, that is beyond my comprehension when I look at that and think about that. Don't grieve for your sons. God was lifted up in this. They did not worship right. Now go with me very quickly, and uh, I'll move on. Acts chapter, uh, excuse me, Genesis chapter four. Uh, Genesis chapter four. And familiar verses of scripture again. Genesis chapter four in the first verse. The Bible says, and Adam knew his wife Eve, knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And she again married his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, now I've heard a lot of different ideas on this, uh, what Cain's era was. Uh, some think that he should have bartered with his brother and got blood. I know they knew about a blood sacrifice. Surely, I mean, they were still wearing, they were wearing garments too by then and something had to die to wear skin. And no doubt Adam and Eve told them about their experience in the Garden of Eden. And they, they knew what had to be done. Again, I, I, I'm not sure about that portion or if he came, maybe he came before with an unclean heart. I don't know. But I do know this, he did not come to worship in the right way. First of all, you do it the way God says to do it. That, that's your earmark. That's your base for worshiping God. Do it as he says to do it. And so we find uh, the, worst, the worst attack on this, apparently, is the process of time. Now you think about, and, and again, I, I believe with the Old Testament studies that I've come to the conclusion that that music is fine in the church. When we meet together, the piano or, or guitars or whatever, a stringed instrument, I think it's fine. I get, I get that from the Psalms. However, it is not in the New Testament. It's not forbidden in the New Testament, but it's not in the New Testament either. And, and, and we know that the primitive Baptists supposedly called, and no regular Baptists supposedly called, uh, that's why they don't have it in there. Uh, they, uh, and you know, that's a very old-fashioned teaching. Nothing wrong with it. But it, 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 it goes way back. In the process of time, things have been compromised. And again, I don't have any issue with this. I've studied it out because I don't, I don't take anything by man's, man's own word. Always study things out yourself. And, and, and so we find that in the, pro the process of time damages God, the people that serve God. Now, it can't, the process of time cannot damage God because he has no time. And it cannot damage the word of God because he said it was eternal too. So the damage comes from us and it impacts us. We, we, so when we begin to worship, we want to be certain that we're doing it in a biblical order and doing it in a biblical way. Uh, verse 3, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain 
brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstling of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Now, I want you to see, we see the first point of God's sovereignty. And he, he respected what Abel did. Was it because he did it right? Probably. Was it because that he just wanted to? That will could be too. Because remember the twins of Isaac? Mm -hmm. He said, <laughs> he, he, he hated one before the beginning. Right. Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. In fact, the New Testament said, <laughs> neither doing good or evil, but the, the, that the purpose of God might be lifted up. And, and so we find, I, I'm not real sure what happened here, but I do know this, there was a way to do it, and, it, and Cain didn't do it the right way. And he suffered for it. He, he, he got into problems for it. He got into difficulties for it. Uh, <clears throat> notice in uh, verse 5, But unto Cain in his offering he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said to Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fall fallen? If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Now, what it, well or good, however they were doing it, he says, you could have done it good. You could have done it well. You could have done it in the right way. And you chose not to. And he says, when you do that, sin lieth at the door. So when we begin not worshiping in the correct way, yeah. what's left? Sin's at the door. More problems coming. Uh, difficulty on the way. And you know the rest of the story. Uh, Cain slays his brother, which I've always found it how interesting how rapidly it went from incorrect worship to murder in the first degree in about three verses. See, we... Uh, so then we must think that worship is a very intrinsic factor that needs to be carefully, carefully followed. Now, let's go to the New Testament in Revelation chapter 1. And we, we're going to find a number of verses that gives us at least some insight into worship and, and lifting up the name of Jesus and, and, and abiding with what he's left us to do. Revelation chapter 1 and uh, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10, the Bible says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. So we're fixing to see a great time of worship and of receiving uh, of an entire book of prophecy and and, and we find that John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. That capital S Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, however you want to uh, say those words. But I want you to see, if you can be in the Spirit, it's intrinsic to worship. And so then if we're out of the Spirit, and a lot of people say, well, you can't be out of the Spirit, you'll be lost. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. Uh, it, it doesn't teach that at all. Uh, you think, you think God's going to bless you at uh, ACDC concerts? You're going to take him down there? You see what I'm saying? You're not going to meet with God there, right? You're out of the Spirit. And, and so we find here that in, in, in this situation, John was in the right way and he was ready to worship. Notice it also says on the Lord's day, very distinct from the Sabbath, we have hundreds upon thousands today running to a seventh back to a seventh day Sabbath and it's simply not of the word of God. New Testament believers worship on the Lord's day. And you know what? John was a Jew among Jews. If, Jew, if, if he'd have meant the Sabbath, you know what he wrote down there? He'd have written, written down the Sabbath because he understood the Sabbath very, very well. If you remember on the night of the trial, 
He was such a good Jew, he was able to sneak, to sneak Peter in to watch the trial. You remember that? And, and so he understood very perfectly well what the Sabbath was, and he defined it here differently as the Lord's Day. So you need the Holy Ghost, and you need to come on the Lord's Day. We, we miss out when, when that does not happen. And I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto uh, Samaria and unto uh, Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and to, lay, uh, and to Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake unto me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now, if you remember, we just read through this uh, a couple of weeks ago, so we won't go that far into it. But I do want you to get this from it. There's preparatory work. You can't come down and worship and, and, and jump out of the car and run into the house of God and expect the Lord to be lifted up. We live in a very, very busy day. And the older I get, the more I see how all-consuming a job, just a job can be. You see, you see what I'm saying? And, and, and what time does that leave left for the Lord? We gotta, we gotta work, right? But it don't have to be all-consuming. It, it don't have to be everything that we do. And, and, and so we find here that preparatory work, if you want to worship God, pray, read, seek the face of God, pray for me before you come. Before you arrive here, make some preparatory work and be ready for, for the Lord to meet with us. You know what? What I found if you... Uh, if you uh, don't come prepared, you're probably not going to get it. You know what I'm saying? If you don't come, if you don't come with your cup, how are you going to get a good drink of water? And, and so we find then that uh, John the Apostle uh, was prepared for this, and because he was prepared for this, uh, we have the, the revelation even today. First Corinthians chapter 14. Now, um, the first Corinth the Corinthian church was in a mess. It had all kinds of, of crazy stuff going on there. Uh, uh, just the whole book. And, and, and we get down to the nut, nut problem, I think it's about chapter eight, when he says you're worshiping his little children. He says, when you should be on meat, you're still on milk. You know what? What should happen as the years go by is your worship should improve, not get more simplistic. And, and remember this about worship. It is never to tickle the flesh. In fact, if your flesh is entertained by it, you need to review it. That's it. Yeah. And, and so we see that it was in that church environment that Paul was led, led, led of the Holy Ghost to, to write this in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and uh, verse 25. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 25, the Bible says, And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, so that falling down on his face, he will worship God, and report that God is in you of a truth. Now, we find, uh, we find some things uh, that are never done in your average church today, and that is literally laying out to praise God. Uh, I've seen that maybe two or three times in my whole life, and I'll soon be 55 years old. Uh, and where would we be branded if we did that? 
Pentecostals, right? You go down to my, where Mother used to go, they always made it poor. <laughs> but then, what do you get there? The very same thing. Why are they laying on the floor? A lot of them just want to be seen, right? A lot of them do it out of no sincerity at all. So, if we were, and, and what good would that accomplish? You ever thought, why, why does the Lord want us to do it that way? Well, I can tell you easily why you can do it that way and why you do it that way. It takes all the puff out of your cells. You want to lay down? If I lay down right now, would y'all be embarrassed for me? <laughs> right? Or would I embarrass y'all? Because we're broadcasting, right? <laughs> but yet and still, we find that is a position of praise. Now, should it be done every time? I don't necessarily think so, because then it becomes mundane, right? But we do know this, and what I think the whole principle about lying before the Lord is this, it takes you out of the equation. Right. You're no longer the banky rooster, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and now you are humbled before the Lord. And, and, and so we find that certainly... That, that, that is a piece of praise that we're missing and that you don't see uh, you don't see that much in any of the Lord's churches uh, anymore. Colossians. Apparently they uh, had some uh, issues too. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 23. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 23 which things have indeed a shoe of wisdom or a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Now that seems like a lot of sentences just crammed together. But what, it, what he's saying is this. Don't bolster this body. This body, not the body of Christ. We want it bolstered. But this body, we don't... Have you ever wondered all the doctrines of separation? What is the purpose of that? And uh, what, what, is, what is that about? What, why do we do that as a people? You ever thought about all those things? I wasn't raised that way, so I'll, I'll be very honest. I've thought about all of them. But I will say this, two things uh, indicative of that. First of all, if the men and the women and the children of this church come dressed in an humble way, who is the one that's going to get the attention? Right? Now, I'll give you a good example. All y'all, all my family remembers my friend Steve Atkins. He was killed in an auto accident over Palmyra. Um, and he came to church with me one time, one time, to bump the smells. I, I'm not even sure if Don and I were married yet, but he came to church, and I won't say this girl's name, but very pretty young girl used to attend that church with us, and she had, on, she had a certain red dress, and she looked very, very attractive in that dress. And uh, when she arrived, my friend leaned over, leaned over and said to me, who's the baby? So, uh, uh, whose attention did, did they get? Did Jesus get the attention? Did the Almighty was lifted up? No, this woman, either knowingly or unknowingly, took Christ's attention. You see what I'm saying? So, in this, we find... There really is a reason that there are things we can do that hinder the Holy Ghost, that, 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 move, the, that move the attention from Christ and move it to you. And those items, those things have to be avoided. They, 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 they have to be stifled down, and thus then is the teachings of separation, of biblical separation from this present world. That's why they're there, not that we can stick out like a sore thumb and uh, uh, there's some of those crazies that go to New Testament. No, no, no. In fact, that probably does the very same thing in the opposite direction. But it is so Christ can be the center of attention. 
and not us. And so we see that as well. Revelation chapter 4. Very familiar. They better be familiar. I just preached to y'all uh, two Wednesday nights ago. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 10. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for all, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Now we find these four and twenty elders, and it, I said the other night, I don't know who their identity is. I've heard a lot of description over that. I think most people don't know any more than me. But I do know this, their intrinsic desire was to worship God. And they took the crown and cast it before the feet of the Lord. Now, have you ever thought, now, and, and I understand this, and I, I've read the crowns in the New Testament, and I believe there are distinctive crowns for different words, and I understand all that. But when, when the queen takes off her crown, what does she become? Normal. Now, in, in the United Kingdom, very, very soon, I think it's in May, uh, uh, King Charles III is going to be inaugurated. He's going to get his crown, and he'll, he'll take on his authority, and you know what? We need to cast off our crowns. I'm the pastor. Bible, you know what the Bible calls me? An under-shepherd. I'm not the shepherd. I'm the under-shepherd. The shepherd is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am accountable unto him, right? So maybe they were giving up their authority. It says that they were, that, that they were princes or that they uh, sit on this great throne Maybe they were casting their crown, their crown, their authority before Christ. And that's what we need to do. You, you know, what would it do to a king or a queen to cast their crown? Number one, almost act like it's worthless and just throw it down there. I think it'd be humiliating. I think it'd be giving up a big integral part of who I was. You think Donna or I want to take our nursing license and put it in the shredder they're, they're, they're very important to me that's how my, I make my living but Christ is more important he, he is to be lifted up and so a lot of times uh, what we need to do to properly worship the Lord is set ourselves aside and, and give him the glory that he that he deserves so what about you this morning? Did you come prepared? Do, do you think you worship? I mean, really, do you, do you think that you worship? Do you think attendance is enough? I, I certainly don't. Uh, I think worship is something far different, don't you? Do you know what attendance is? All that attendance is is faithfulness. That, that's what attendance is. But I don't think it really means that you worship. What about worshiping alone? Do you think that's possible? I certainly do. We just heard that John on the Isle of Patmos was all, all alone. And you know that, that Sunday morning he got up and he was excited and, he, and no doubt he prayed and he got in the Spirit all by himself in that lonely place where people went to starve to death. <laughs> That's a precarious situation to begin getting, getting close to the Lord, is it not? But he did. And, and, and that's what we need. It, it may not be here. I, I won't worship to be in this little old building. But you know what? Worship can be in my pickup. Worship can be uh, when I'm mowing the grass. Worship arrives when we are ready. So you say, well, 
I don't worship much. Well, dear friend, let me say this. The problem is you. It's not Christ. Amen. And we need to worship Him. 